So these last two weeks, we've been in the book of Job, looking at the narrative from a story standpoint and breaking down mere morsels of their speeches to focus on. We could easily spend the rest of this year going verse by verse through the book of Job, and it would not fail to provide ample enough scripture and insight to preach every Sunday for the rest of 2021. On my first Sunday covering Job, we did a general synopsis of the storyline and then focused on Job's three friends and took snapshots of what they were saying that would be correct someday, but was misapplied when speaking about Job or to life right now. Last week, we focused on Job himself and what I believe is the heart of the issue surrounding the whole narrative. This week, we are going to talk about this fourth man, this mystery man who apparently came into the picture somewhere in the story and has been sitting quietly and listening up to this point. And then the grand crescendo is when God himself shows up and confronts all of these characters, but directs his cross-examination at Job himself. I am seeing that I made an error, and I should have asked for four weeks instead of three, just so we could spend a week on Elihu. It is that rich. I, I got into it and was just like, oh man, I made a big mistake here. Because it, it is, it, I, I thought he was just kind of a minor character in the story. He is not. As it stands, though, we can't and we will only uh, be able to touch on a morsel or two of what he said, but his message is powerful, as you will soon learn. Elihu comes on the scene in chapter 32 and proceeds to trump all over cultural boundaries that we still use today, and he chews out everybody. Essentially, he was saying, I am younger, and I acknowledge that you are old but wisdom does not reside on silver hair alone. I am right, and you are all wrong. Just as Jesus had John the Baptist, and the plains have the foothills before the mountain, so I see Elihu here in these six chapters as a bridge between what Job and his three friends were saying and what God will say himself. Elihu's main premise here is that God is God alone. And though he sees everything you do, if he is affected, it is because he wills it to be. If he is not affected, it is because he wills it to be. Elihu, in his different rantings, keeps his entire focus always on God, and this is enlightening. Are you suffering? It is because God has allowed it. Whatever you have to say about your suffering is irrelevant. Are you prospering? It is because God has allowed it. And whatever you have to say about your prospering is irrelevant. Who can understand His ways? If you are holy, does it affect Him? If you are evil, is He disturbed? He is God, and He is mighty, and if He notices you at all, it is because He chose to. You see, the difference with what Elihu says, they are between what he says and the other four characters, Job and his three friends, are different. It's very subtle, but it's very powerful. He was chewing out Job's three friends because they had the audacity to think that they understood God and His ways. This is evidenced by their prosperity gospel karma type speeches. What Elihu successfully argues is, how does an ant comprehend the boot of a man, let alone the man himself? And for Job, with his suffering, Elihu chews him out as well, because his despair and suffering grant him no more right or justification to question God than at any other time in his life or ever. You see, Job was essentially conveying that if I am in deep suffering, I long to die, I hate my life, and why not be bold and use my pointer finger as I speak to the Almighty? This is why Elihu attacked Job. 
Who the heck are you to take that tone with God at all? What does he who made the universe owe you? And we'll see that God himself takes that same tone when he shows up. Elihu would suck as a grief counselor. But this whole platform is not about counseling grief. If you know the whole story of Job, then you also know that God does not soothe Job either. Elihu's platform toward Job is God is God and he does what he pleases. Who can understand his ways? Who can comprehend his wisdom? Nothing exists that isn't fully known and laid bare naked by his understanding. So let me repeat all of these premises again so that they are nice and neat in your mind. Elihu chewed up Job's three friends because they thought that they understood God and his ways and therefore thought that they could co-judge what was going on with Job. Elihu chewed up Job because Job thought that his misery, suffering, and blamelessness entitled him to special audience with God and license to raise his voice, question his ways, and to be less reverent with a pointing finger attitude. It's vital to note here that when God shows up and runs Job through a clinic on how he is not God and expresses his anger with Job's three friends, Elihu is not mentioned amongst God's displeasure. <clears throat> so we can deduct that what Elihu said about God is true and accurate. Elihu's true calling may not be to the sick and the suffering, but what he said about God and life was not wrong or misapplied. Let's take a quick look at some of what he said. Turn with me to Job 34, starting with verse 21. His eyes are on the ways of mortals. He sees their every step. There is no deep shadow, no utter darkness where evildoers can hide. God has no need to examine people further that they should come before him for judgment. Without inquiry, he shatters the mighty and he sets up others in their place. Because he takes note of their deeds, he overthrows them in the night and they are crushed. He punishes them for their wickedness where everyone can see them, because they turned from following him and had no regard for any of his ways. They caused the cry of the poor to come before him, so that he heard the cry of the needy. But if he remains silent, who can condemn him? If he hides his face, who can see him? Yet he is over individual and nation alike. To keep the godless from ruling, from laying snares for the people. Suppose someone says to God, I am guilty but will offend no more. Teach me what I cannot see. If I have done wrong, I will not do so again. Should God then reward you on your terms when you refuse to repent? So let me break it down for you. Elihu is like the guy that steps in to break up a fight but ends up starting a fight with the whole bar. What is he saying? He's saying, don't be under the notion that just because he watches you, that you are worth watching. God is busy doing his thing. And his ways are higher than yours, than mine. Just because he watches you doesn't mean that he should heed your advice to take you to the ER when you stub your toe or cut off your leg. He may or may not, but the severity of your condition still does not give you precedent with him. And we think it should. Turn to Job 35. Then Elihu said, starting with verse 1, Do you think this is just? You say, I am in the right, not God. Then you ask him, what profit is it to me, and what do I gain by not sinning? I would like to reply to you and to your friends with you. Look up at the heavens and see. Gaze at the clouds so high above you. If you sin, how does that affect him? If your sins are many, what does that do to him? If you are righteous, 
what do you give to him? Or what does he receive from your hand? Your wickedness only affects humans like yourself, and your righteousness only other people. People cry out under a load of oppression. They plead for relief from the arm of the powerful. But no one says, where is God, my maker, who gives songs in the night? Who teaches us more than he teaches the beasts of the earth? He makes us wiser than the birds of the sky. He does not answer when people cry out because of the arrogance of the wicked. Indeed, God does not listen to their empty plea. The Almighty pays no attention to it. How much less, then, will he listen when you say that you do not see him? As Elihu so eloquently puts here, but it's kind of tough to see amongst the poetry, is any of the worst wickedness you could contrive or righteousness that you could scrape together does not affect him one bit. He does his own thing on the earth and with men, and if you make a splash at all, be it for good or evil, it is of no difference to him. What you bring to the table, righteousness or wickedness, is of no consequence to God in terms of actual weight that he should pay attention. If God is not concerned at all about the devil running loose down here on the earth, how much less should he be concerned about any evil or righteousness that little old you could drum up? So, you may then ask, so why does he pay attention to us? Why does he watch us? Why does he care what we do? Well, because, child, he loves you. And his desire is that you would be conformed to the image of his son, that you would live and act like family. He doesn't pay attention because he needs to be on guard for the level of evil you're doing or because the righteousness because your righteousness is approaching his own he pays attention because god is love and has chosen me and you as the object of that love that and only that is why he chooses to pay us any mind at all if you want to take your 4 year old to disneyland for a vacation what assistance can that four-year-old provide? Here, Dad, I found a penny. Let's put that with the rest of it toward the trip. The child cannot in any physical way contribute anything at all to the trip. That's reality. But you take the child to Disneyland because you love them. That is also our reality. If we can truly grasp that God loves us and that we are the beneficiaries of that love for no worthiness of our own account, then we have the right perspective when approaching Him. It's a paradox, really. We are unworthy. We could never be worthy and yet of great worth to Him. The whole concept of worth is simply defined by the price that a party is willing to pay. So what was God willing to pay? For God, He was willing to pay the life of His Son to redeem you and me and to span that mighty chasm between us. This guy Elihu is not the kind of guy that you want writing Hallmark cards. But his general attitude, perspective, and zeal are what was necessary as a bridge to what happens next. God shows up. Now, before we dig in, how does one even begin to speak of the remainder of this book and add any kind of insight into God's words? God's presence and His words not only addressed the situation, and especially the attitudes of Job and his friends, but they also address our attitudes and our situations today. We understand far more than we would have in Job's day about how the universe works. But whether we understand it, think we understand it, or, 
or know that we can't understand it, there isn't one item that God mentions, whether we understand it or not, that we can control. God's general demeanor, attitude, and aggressiveness of His words have always troubled me concerning Job and my own life. We know that God is love, but that this was not the time to show it. We first needed to know that God is mighty, awesome, powerful, and especially, hear this, beyond our human comprehension. When God confronted Job, this was the time for us to learn that lesson. God showing up and handing out hugs would not have conveyed what he was wanting to show Job or us at that time. Do I believe that God cared about the suffering of Job? Yes, I do. Just as he cares if we are suffering individually. But because his ways are so much higher than our ways, he also knows that he also knows what he is doing or allowing in our lives, and he is not going to suffer silly or aggressive challenges to his character or his knowledge on how he does it. God shows us his heart in 2 Peter 3 9, when Peter states that God desires that no flesh would perish. That is his heart. But again, you cannot truly understand or appreciate, appreciate the solution until you understand the problem. All of these primary speakers have talked about is how high and lofty God is. But God is about to take that up a notch and show us just how not high and not lofty we are. You see, God is about to cross-examine Job and for the benefit of us all, run us through a knowledge wisdom, power, and science gauntlet. So let's get into what God has to say. Turn to Job 38. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you? When I laid the earth's foundation, tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? What can I say here that would add any insight to what the Lord is saying? Job and his friends knew that God was mighty, but just how mighty? So God flips it on them. Okay, Job, we all agree that I am mighty, but how mighty are you? Moving on, we're going to skip around a bit. Again, as we have had to do both of these last two weeks, we simply don't have time to cover all of God's challenges to Job. So let's skip down to verse 16. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. Even with all of our technology, we cannot do any of these things, and you may be stunned to learn that there are vast portions of the earth still uncharted. We have in this last century discovered that there are indeed springs in the ocean, but that knowledge is less than 100 years old. We still can't walk in the recesses of the deep. We've been there, protected by a reinforced steel barrel, but only in the last 10 years. To this very day, 80% of the world's oceans remain unexplored and unmapped, and only 65% of the whole world has been surveyed. We know even less about death. Few people ever return from it, and if they do, we don't believe them. Even though it's right there in the Bible, the Bible mentions more than 10 people returning from the dead, most notably Jesus. For something so common to mankind, we know nothing about it, except what God himself has shared with us. Let's move on. Go with me to Job 38, starting with verse 22. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail, which I reserve for times of battle, 
for days of war and battle? This one seems odd, except that we know that God uses weather as a weapon, and hail specifically as a sniper rifle. How many battles over our history might have had a different outcome if the weather had not turned for the worse or for the better? When thinking of a reference, just narrow it down to World War II or the Napoleonic Wars, where winter storms were the tipping factor between victory and defeat. And as for hail, we need to look no further than what Reverend Palmer just preached a couple of months ago in Joshua chapter 10, the Battle of Gibeon, where more of the Amorites were killed by hail than those who fell by the sword. We see hail, we see hail fall on Egypt as one of the ten plagues, except in Goshen, where the Israelites dwelt. In Revelation, hail will be used again, and those suckers are going to be a hundred pounds apiece. Let's look at another challenge of God to Job. This next one is fascinating to me. Starting with verse 31. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or lead out the bear with its cubs? Do you know the laws of heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? For those of you not well-versed in astronomy, the Pleiades is a constellation that sits just up from Orion's bow, and Orion himself is just down a little and to the left. All of this is most easily spotted by looking for Orion's belt in the sky. In Greek mythology, the Pleiades are seven sisters on the run from Orion, and that fella needs a restraining order. Now this is all just sounds like uh, space stuff until you hear some history. Let me start by saying that almost all of our constellations are not groupings of stars at all. They only appear as groups to us. The Big Dipper, which isn't, a, which isn't an official constellation anyway, is estimated to be eight light years across. At least to me, that does not constitute a grouping, even if it still serves as a navigational tool. But seriously, if you take the constellations like Ursa Major or Gemini, you can have serious light years in between the distance of those stars. To put it in perspective, it's like if you were standing in Coeur d'Alene looking west and seeing me at my house on South Hill and seeing Bruce Palmer standing here on the West Plains and seeing that we were standing next to each other. In two dimensions we are, but in three there's vast difference between us. All right, Trav, thanks. Where are you going with this? In the very first ever recorded book of the Bible, God questions Job on a matter of astronomy that we couldn't prove until this century. You see, the Pleiades is actually a constellation of stars that is gravitationally bound to each other. Galileo was the first to document this constellation in 1610, but we didn't know that they were bound to each other until we had uh, telescopes powerful enough to see that they move as one unit. But God asks Job right there in chapter 38 if he can bind the Pleiades. But wait, there's more. What does God say after that? Can you loosen the belt of Orion? If there's one constellation that everybody is familiar with, it's that creepy stalker. Orion. Someone needs to inform him that you don't chase women with a bow. Spotting Orion's belt is pretty easy. Look for three bar, uh, bright stars in a row angling upward at a 45 degree angle. Orion is not gravitationally bound, including his belt. And it's only been within the last 30 years with high-powered digital telescopes that we can see and measure that his belt is slipping. And those three stars are moving away from each other. And finally, we have lead out the bear with her cubs. Both the NIV and the ESV get this wrong, as it is a Greek mythology contamination of the passage. 
It may be part of the she-bear constellation, but that is not what the King James says, and that makes all the difference in the world. The King James translates it, Canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? No one knew what the heck that meant because Arcturus is a singular star. Well, we discovered in 1971 that Arcturus isn't one just massive star. I mean, it is. It's a supergiant. But it also has 52 smaller stars closely knit in its trail that are being pulled along gravitationally. We couldn't see that until 1971 when we finally had a super telescope strong enough to view it as more than just one bright shiny star. Moreover, now we know that Arcturus is traveling at a speed of 257 miles per second. Our own sun travels at 12 miles per second. Astronomers now know that any star traveling at over 25 miles per second is highly unstable. And Arcturus travels at 257 miles per second, which means that its path is highly erratic, highly unstable, and highly unpredictable. No one knows where it's going to go. Now we see what God said come into focus. And with our modern technology, are proving that what, when God stated, Canst thou guide Arcturus with his 52 sons? Because I can. It was a challenge to Job. And we are learning five to 6,000 years later that God was right on the money. I spent a lot of time on that one, so we're going to skip ahead to chapter 40. But please read this book on your own time. It is so revelatory that it will blow your mind. And like I said earlier, it will change your perspective on a mighty, awesome, majestic, all-powerful God and to what lengths He went to provide a way for you and Him to be together. Turn with me to chapter 40, starting with verse 1. Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy, I can, how can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's? Can your voice thunder like His? Then adorn yourself with glory and splendor, and clothe yourself in honor and majesty. Unleash the fury of your wrath. Look at all who are proud and bring them low. Look at all who are proud and humble them. Crush the wicked where they stand. Bury them all in the dust together. Shroud their faces in the grave. Then I myself will admit to you, that your own right hand can save you. As Elihu stated, God is above and beyond what we can possibly imagine. Here, God is standing on that pre-laid foundation and He builds on it. Let's talk about justice. You would question me. Remember when I spoke of Elihu talking about whether you be the holiest of men born of women or the wickedest of men under the sun, the richest or the most destitute, the happiest or the most miserable. What is that to God who is above the stars and the angels? Well, God expands on that here concerning His justice. Can you adorn yourself with splendor or majesty or bring the proud low? Can you crush all of the wicked at one time? Then I myself will admit to you that your own right arm can save you. That makes my blood run cold, church. In the very first book ever written in the Bible, God tells us through this Job narrative what the white throne judgment is going to be like. Listen and shudder. On that day of judgment for those who die in their sins, there will be many who think that they are going to argue with God. 
their reasonings are going to sound like this. I don't agree. I don't care. I can't believe in a God who allows suffering in the world. I won't believe in a God who has been so hard on me. You took my grandma away too early. I was broke all of my life, or sick in body, all of my life. Bad people did bad things to me, and that is why I am bad. You made me this way. I scored a solid B plus in the way that I lived. I didn't smoke or chew or hang with those who do. This is acceptable by every other standard on earth. You should grade on a curve. What humanity doesn't understand, can't understand, couldn't possibly comprehend is just how high and mighty and powerful and terribly holy God is. At the white throne judgment for those who have died in their sin, God will not be shrouded in a thunderstorm. They are going to see Him as He is. If the New Testament is a salvation message about Jesus Christ, then the book of Job is a salvation warning. No excuses, no reasonings, no pleas for a second chance will have any effect. Mankind's excuses, reasonings, and pleas will bounce off of a holy mountain and burn up in his consuming fire. That is, if mankind can, is able to utter a word at all. Let's move on. I want to talk, talk to you about two very interesting creatures that God begins to talk about next. Starting with verse 15. Look at Behemoth, which I made along with you, and which feeds on grass like an ox. What strength it has in its loins, what power in the muscles of its belly. Its tail sways like a cedar. The sinews of its thighs are close-knit. Its bones are tubes of bronze. Its limbs like rods of iron. It ranks first amongst the works of God, yet its maker can approach it with his sword. The hills bring it their produce, and all the wild animals play nearby. Under the lotus plant it lies, hidden among the reeds in the marsh. The lotus conceals it in their shadow. The poplars by the stream surrounds it. A raging river does not alarm it, it is secure, though the Jordan should surge against its mouth. Can anyone capture it by the eyes or trap it and pierce its nose? Here again, <coughs> God questions Job on his ability as a man to subdue even another one of God's created creatures. We're not going to spend a lot of time on Behemoth because he is far less interesting than the next one. But I will tell you this. My NIV has a footnote that translates this beast as a hippo, which I would find offensive if it weren't so funny. This, clearly, this, clear, this is clearly man taking way too many liberties in translating the mystery and focusing on some details while completely overlooking or negating other details that are right there. We know that this beast hides amongst the lotus plants, which to us Americans looks like a lily pad. It lives in or near the water. It's a vegetarian because it feeds on grass. The hills bring its, its produce, and all the wild animals play safely nearby. It is incredibly st uh, strong and, and stockily built. However, there are some descriptions that they simply skip right over. Its tail sways like a cedar. It ranks first amongst the works of God. Can anyone trap it and pierce its nose? This is a lazy translation, folks. Have you ever seen a hippo's tail? I'm not kidding. Google that. It's about a foot long, and it goes like this. But it's compared with a cedar tree? It ranks first amongst the works of God. Really? There are lots of creatures bigger than a hippo, like the elephant and the rhino. Hippos are well documented at sometimes preferring meat. Can anyone trap it and pierce its nose? Yes, I imagine we probably could if we wanted to. We've certainly trapped them. Almost all big zoos have a hippo. No, church, this is not a hippo. My own personal belief 
is that God is referring to a brontosaurus or a brachiosaurus type creature. Something roughly 100 foot long, vegetar vegetarian, powerful, but also docile. And its tail makes up a third or better of its whole length. The next beast that, God's described, that God describes is Leviathan. We don't have enough time to go through the whole thing, but I want to leave you with some utterly fascinating details about this creature and propose a conjecture that might be brand new to you. Starting with chapter 41, verse 1. Can you pull in Leviathan with a fish hook or tie down its tongue with a rope? Can you put a cord through its nose or pierce its jaw with a hook? It will, keep beg will it keep begging you for mercy? Will it speak to you with gentle words? Will it make an agreement with you for you to take it as a slave for life? Again, the lazy translation of my Bible has a footnote that thinks that this thing is a crocodile. However, Crocodiles have been caught with fish hooks, and one need look no further than verse 18 to see that this is clearly not a crocodile. Let's pick up the description of him in verse 18. Its snorting throws out flashes of light. Its eyes are like the rays of the dawn. Flames stream from its mouth. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke pours from its nostrils, as from a boiling pot over burning reeds. Its breath sets coals ablaze, and flames dart from its mouth. Strength resides in its neck. Dismay goes before him. That sound like a crocodile to you? Jumping down to verse 31. It makes the depths churn like a boiling cauldron, and stirs up the sea like a pot of ointment. It leaves a glistening wake behind it. One would think the deep had white hair. Nothing on earth is its equal, a creature without fear. It looks down on all that are haughty. It is king over all that are proud. Let me ask you a question. I jumped ahead of myself. Does that sound like a crocodile to you? What God describes here is so massive, so fierce, so terrifying that nothing on earth could stand against it. God gives 10 verses to the behemoth and 34 to the Leviathan. So what creature, known or mythical, do we know of that fits this description? It's a dragon, folks. So why do so many ancient civilizations have carved or painted images that match this description? Might I suggest that the dragon is not mythical at all? I might lose my preaching privileges on this next statement, but I believe that Leviathan is going to be seen again, as in he or they exist today. Remember God's description of where Leviathan lives? It makes the depths churn like a boiling cauldron, and it stirs up the sea like a pot of ointment. It leaves a glistening wake behind it. One would think the deep had white hair. Earlier, we talked about just how little we know of our oceans, and 80% of the oceans are uncharted. Nor can we navigate the deep with any type of success. We can only visit it for a brief period of time. Now fasten your seatbelts here, folks. The rabbit hole goes even deeper. Do you remember where God was describing behemoth? It ranks first amongst the works of God yet its maker can approach it with a sword. Almost like Behemoth and God knew each other, the same way you would know your pet. Pappy is a really intimidating beast unless he knows you. But what about Leviathan? What does God say of him? Nothing on earth is its equal, a creature without fear. It looks down on all that are haughty. It is the king over all that are proud. How can behemoth rank first amongst the works of God, but nothing on earth is Leviathan's equal? Yes, that's where I'm going. I am proposing that Leviathan was not created by God. God can walk up to behemoth casually 
even with a sword in his hand. However, Leviathan had to be pulled up with a fish hook and beg for mercy. It had to use gentle words with God and make an agreement with God to be his slave for life. My conjecture here is that Leviathan never had a right to exist. We only see that in one other place in all of Scripture. Genesis chapter 6, where the angels saw that women were pretty and took for themselves wives and sired super beings called Nephilim. The Nephilim also had no right to exist. They were not created by God. I cannot speak to the mechanics of how that work, how that works, but to me this is conceivable as Leviathan is certainly a super being and to him the flood of Noah would have not been a problem. However, where does God anywhere else assign evil attributes to an animal that he has created? In the end, this is some really interesting information, but the bottom line is that nothing is above God. He reminds Job of that in verse 10 of chapter 41. No one is fierce enough to rouse Leviathan. Then, who then is able to stand against me? Who has a claim against me that I must pay? Everything under heaven belongs to me. So here is the end of the matter, the conclusion. When God is done questioning Job, Job is utterly humbled and despises himself. He repents and asks forgiveness, and God then shares his displeasure with Job's three friends. Elihu is not indicted here, only the first three. They also have to take a bunch of their livestock and offer sacrifices for forgiveness, and Job will offer prayers on their behalf which God accepts. So, Job is clearly restored to health and is comforted by his family and friends. Then the Lord prospers him again and accrues double what he lost, and he has another seven sons and three daughters. It is also interesting here to note that the boys are only listed as seven, but the daughters' names are given and that they were the most beautiful in all the land at that time. Remember, ancient Hebrew has many layers, which means that what they were named would also characterize Job's life. The fact that they were the most beautiful in the land sounds like vanity, and you wonder why that detail is listed. It means there is an invitation to keep digging there, dig into the names. <clears throat> His daughters were Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Karen Hepek. Jemima means dove, which symbolizes peace. Keziah is Hebrew for cassia, which is a flower used in the making of perfume. So we have fragrance. And Karen Hepek translates into horn of beauty. King David used horn a lot to describe the place of rule or power. So in Hebrew, this hidden detail translates to the message that Job's life was ruled by peace, fragrance, and beauty. Beloved, God is so faithful. Yes, we struggle. Yes, we hurt. Yes, we suffer tragedy and loss. But these are for His divine purposes, which include your refinement and conformance to the image of His Son. When we have learned what we need to through our experiences from His hand, we too will be restored and we too will be marked by peace, fragrance, and beauty, whether in this life or the next. Job's life is proof that Satan was wrong. Be careful in thinking that your life for whatever reason, deserves to be hedged in and prospered. It pleases God that the righteous would live by faith. Faith in what He has done, not in how we perceive our lives to be going, whether good or bad. God does not want you to be righteous because it adds righteousness to the world. He wants you to live righteously because that's what His family looks like. You can bring nothing to God 
as Job clearly experienced. But he has made a way and an invitation for you to come unto him through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this aggressive and sobering message of love that you've given us in the book of Job. Lord, we thank you that you opened up secrets, Lord God, especially the secrets in our hearts. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would convict us where we have little pockets of self-righteousness, Lord, that we need to bring to the cross and lay at your feet. We come to you only because you invited us and the work that you did for us. That is our only justification to be there. Lord, would you purify our hearts and our minds and our faith? Lord God, we ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.